Saturday, May 18th, and this is your weekly wrap-up of the wine business, of restaurants and gastronomy, and everything that is going on in this segment. This week was dominated by news that were more concerned about the fear of alcohol or being drunk. Let's say possibilities to deal with hangovers. In addition, I will introduce a new section in this weekly update podcast. I want to say thank you very much to my fellow friend, Lucas, who brought me this idea, who was the inspiration for this idea. As you might have noticed, I record this podcast every single week in my wine cellar. And he said, why don't you grab a random bottle? Just tell a story about it. Maybe you have a, a very personal story about the wine and just le let people know. And I mean, my credo is drink less but better. And most of the wines stored in this cellar are of higher quality, are yeah, related to a specific story, usually to small, high-quality producers and or at least a, a very, very good price value. And this is what I will do at the end of every episode, beginning from now on. So have fun and look forward to what the first bottle might be. And spoiler alert, it's not a peanut. Welcome to the Pinot and Pizza podcast episode number 158, the weekly update with some alerting news for booze lovers, for beer lovers. The Balearic Islands have forced, have introduced a rule that you won't be allowed to drink in public from 9.30 p.m. until 8 a.m. And you cannot sell, as an owner of a shop, alcohol to the people between 9.30 and 8 a.m., the only chance to get alcohol will be in restaurants, in bars, and in, in pubs, of course. But the public consumption and the public sale will be, be forbidden. And if you're caught, you have to pay a fee of 3,000 euro. That was pretty weird and pretty yeah, alerting news this week. There were many, many people arguing about that, especially on social media. Basically, the idea behind is quite simple. They started in 2020 and they wanted to change the tourism, the idea of the tourists coming to the Balearic Islands from being super excessive to more culture and people oriented. So what they did already in 2020 is they forbid it from zero to eight in the morning and right now they enlarged it to 9 30 and i mean there is 14 million tourists each year in mallorca 40 percent account for germany so that's 40 percent over six million germans there is no official numbers but i would guess at least 30 percent is the palaman beer tourism and what I know from friends and colleagues, it's also a thing, especially in, in the UK. So people travel to the Balearic Islands to enjoy the the culture of drinking and especially correlated with the Balaman and the music culture that has been built since the 1970s. I guess 1974 was the first year where a German uh, music star entered the stage, got on stage and got quite famous nationally and internationally just due to the fact that he was playing at the Balaman. So 50 years of drinking culture, 50 years of implementing very popular and also very awkward kind of culture, drinking culture in Mallorca. And they tried to change that. They have tried that for at least three, four, four years now. And this is the next step to uh, Mallorca being a more attractive tourist site for people who are looking for relaxation, for wellness, for just enjoyment, for beaches that are not overcrowded with drunk people. In addition, there is, of course, no nude sunbathing allowed. I guess um, women have to pay 700 euro if they enjoy a sunbath topless. You're not allowed to have sex in public, of course, but I mean, this is not surprising, is it? <laughs> and it's not only Mallorca. We also talk about the other uh, islands such as Ibiza or Menorca. This is the attempt of the Balearic Islands to get more serious, to get more focused and to get more... It's, it's actually, it's quite tough to put... Because, I mean, there is many, many regions where tourism is built around drinking culture. I mean, of, of course, usually it's, it's wine region, but there are some other specific places where you usually head towards when you 
just want to get drunk. But Mallorca wants to focus more on the good side of tourism. Let's put it like this. I mean, there is 70 wineries on Mallorca, just on Mallorca itself. 60% is exported to Germany. So the Germans know the, I would say, the, the Spanish, the Mallorquin wines quite well. There is some interesting wines. Uh, Anima Negra, for example, makes good wines. Um, I know them quite well, especially the aged ones. So this wine has also potential to age. Some people might have recognized this bottle every now and then. It's a red label where you have an A and an N and then a slash and the number two. So Anima Negra Due or Dos. Yeah, it's Dos. It's Spanish. <laughs> so Anima Negra Dos. And there is some aging potential between 20 to 10 to 20 years. Um, quite a nice bottle and also um, a quite nice wine, of course, not a nice bottle, <laughs> not a designer. But the good thing is that the price value ratio is quite good on this bottle. I guess it's 20 euro or something retail price. So if we can ever spot that, have a glass of that. And I mean, from now on, you will probably see more wine drinkers than beer lovers on the Balearic Islands. Coming from drunk people in the streets to, let's say, The idea of how to deal with hangovers, and there was two exciting news this week. On the one hand, there was a Swiss university that did some studies with a protein gel that is said to better deal with the consequences of intoxicating your body with alcohol. And they did some tests with mice, <laughs> poor mice. <laughs> And what they uh, discovered in the end is that 30 minutes after the single serving of alcohol, the gel reduced the alcohol level in, in the mice by 40%. And after five hours, it has dropped by around 56%. How does it work? Mezenga, so the, he's one of the, of the people working in, um, in the research team, said the gel shifts the breakdown of alcohol from the liver to the digestive tract. In contrast, when alcohol is metabolized in the liver, no harmful acetaldehyde is produced as an intermediate product. Basically, this means that your body has been intoxicated, of course, by alcohol, but it's already brought from the stomach to your digestive tract. And what also is quite interesting, that you can use the gel even if you haven't drunk any alcohol because there was no reaction at all when you didn't have any alcohol present in your body. The gel could be of particular interest to people who don't want to give up alcohol completely, but don't want to put a strain on their bodies and aren't actively seeking the effects of alcohol. This is what the research team suggested. I mean, of course, there will be people that would be interested in this kind of gel when they know they can have a, I don't know, freaky night with alcohol and the good and the bad stuff that comes along with the consumption of alcohol and then use the gel to kind of recover in a more efficient way, in a faster way. The researchers have applied for a pattern on this gel. Yeah, soon to be communicated, I guess. But at least it won't be allowed to advertise this kind of product. But I mean, if people, especially in the industry, know that stuff like this exists, they usually communicate that at least to peers or to colleagues. And um, usually this kind of stuff gets viral way faster. So we will definitely hear about that if it will work and if it will be published. Talking about advertisement on products that prevent hangovers, there was a TikTok ad by a company called Hang Cure Limited. It advertised the, a product called Hangover Cure, which is said to be an efficient way to deal with your hangover. So when you had a really heavy night with alcohol, you just take your medicine, you you, you take the, what, what was it by the way? Was it pills or was it a liquid? Yeah, it, it, it looks like a pill that you put in water. It's magnesium, acetylcysteine and all the, yeah, some weird other stuff, riboflavin, phosphate, thiamine, <laughs> whatever that means. I have no clue. So it's a mixture, mixture of chemical ingredients. And there was a, a bartender man cave bartender he was using hanker taking two ca uh, capsules okay so it's a capsule before drinking so saying this is the ultimate hangover cure and of course this was banned by the asa if you're not familiar with the asa the asa is the advertising standards authority that check on what products are available what products are advertised and if this works with the current rules of advertisement. For example, it doesn't work with cigarettes, it doesn't work with drugs, of course, and with medicine. And 
yeah, let's put it like this with, with substances such as hangover cure. Because, I mean, with the communication that was done, you might get the feeling that you can drink whatever you want and how much you want and then just take two or three pills and then the next day everything will be fine. And I mean, this could work because I mean, there's, this is basically, it's a, a bomb of electrolytes. <laughs> but in the end, you will definitely struggle with some headache probably if you had uh, too few water. And in addition, the intoxication is still happening. So this is why they banned the ad. Nevertheless, the product will still be available from drinking behavior and the people to, I would say, a big concern, especially in gastronomy, not only in Central Europe, but especially over there, it's, it's, it's a big thing. The staff shortage in gastronomy, in restaurants, in bars. And there was a super interesting German article, by the way, in Meininger, but what you could do, I mean, I usually use this as well. You can trans use the translation function of, in my case, Google Chrome to just translate it in English. I will put the German link in the show notes. It's called Robotic Kitchen. Is this the solution for staff shortage? And basically they talk about two different companies that provide robots working in the kitchen, replacing chefs and waiters. And to me, super interesting project because with the discussions on AI, on technology, on what is even possible today and will even be possible in the future, especially with those kind of technology. People are sometimes afraid of, will I be replaced by AI? And there is many, many articles on that, but there's also articles why AI won't take your job. And it really depends on where you work, um, what is your occupation, and can you be replaced in total? Or is this kind of, I don't know, um, to me, especially working with AI is more something of a combination. So I use AI tools for my daily business to just get more efficient, to work more efficiently and to be able to do more tasks in a shorter amount of time. But of course, there's also the, the fear of losing jobs in specific industries. In gastronomy, we already know that we have a staff shortage and the, pro the problem will grow in the future due to the fact that many, many baby boomers will retire. So the robot thing is a good thing. Of course, there is the question, how can I use robots in my kitchen? Because cooking is a process. So if it's just about processing food in a very consistent, stable, and of course also tasty way, it's a standard process. You just use the same ingredients with the same weight or volume, and then you put them together you cook them, you bake them, whatever, then you can just provide it to the customers. And of course, a machine, a robot doesn't have to take breaks. It doesn't have to sleep. So this can work 12 to 20 hours. You can even do three shifts with it in, in just one step and one single block. Of course, cooking is also art. So when we talk about fine dining, we talk about like micro food and all this kind of stuff, it could get tough to work with Robots, I mean, it will be possible in the future, I would say in five to six years, but talking about today, I would say the robotic kitchen is more a thing for the mid-range gastronomy. It's not even stuff for fast food because I guess, especially fast food, you're more efficient with the, the current system. And of course, also the margins are lower, so it could be quite expensive or let's say, ineffective to buy a robot for a quarter million euro just to ameliorize your processes, to fasten your processes. So I would say it's a, a more thing for mid-range. Fine dining, of course, you will need the people. And when people go to a restaurant that offers fine dining options, usually it's people that are able or willing to pay more, not only for the food, but also for the services that come along. So the margins are higher and of course I can also say if there's three people working in the kitchen and I can afford them and I probably have to pay them more that they will stay because many, many people left, especially during COVID, then it would work with fine dining. So this is something for, I would say, mid-range gastronomy. It's super interesting what is currently possible. So let's say the creation of standard recipes is quite simple. Bowls, it, it can create every single bowl that you can imagine. And 
it also is responsible for cleaning and polishing the dishes because this can be automated. This is, of course, something that makes you way more efficient when you have something like this. And the company that did some, I would say, prototyping uh, invested half a million euro in a kind of a show kitchen just to do some tests with the robots and, of course, also serve people, customers, with their bowls, with the recipes, uh, with their meals. And it it seems to be quite successful. Of course, it still sounds quite expensive. But when you think about having a robot for 250,000 euro replacing, I would say, three to four people in a kitchen, I would say after three to four years, this is definitely amortized. From the robotic kitchen of the future, we go to what was going on in the world of brands. And we start with Pernod Ricard. We have recently talked about Pernod Ricard because they are focusing more on quality, more on efficiency. And it is said that they are in talks with Accolade Wines from Australia to sell their Australian wine division. And they don't talk about terms or um, timeframes and stuff like that. It's just that they are currently in negotiations and soon to be published if it has worked out or not. I mean, it's 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 quite a big division, and um, we already we have already talked about the struggles that have been not only at Panorica but in general in the Australian wine sector due to the fact that they won't they weren't able to ship their wines, especially to China, and they depended on China in a very, very big way. I guess it was 40% or something. They lost over a billion dollars each year because China wasn't expect uh, accepting their wines fee-free. And right now, it said that they think about um, selling it to Accolade for 265 million pounds or 300 million euro, um, fair amount. This is not the only company that's thinking about changing something in their wine portfolio. We have talked about other companies, Treasury Wine Estate, Constellation Brands. There is this huge shift going on in the market. Some are going to or heading towards alcohol-free products. Some are more focusing on the fine world of wine or at least the higher quality level because we have this huge wine lake worldwide and especially the, the base wine section is tough to sell at the moment because of the decreasing demand in wine in general. So the higher the quality, the probably easier it is to sell it. So we will see many, many other companies in the future that will communicate, we will sell or we have already sold our portfolio, this and that. And this is this typical brand roulette. Let's put it like this. Um, we have seen many, many times uh, in the past, especially in wine industry. Another big company that is changing their goals and their future direction of the company is Gallo. I mean, EG Gallo is the biggest winery in the world with over, with over 1,400 hectares, and they are now entering the beer category. They bought Montaki Cold Snacks. Basically, it's a really interesting deal because Montaki Cold Snacks, uh, it's not only about branding because they know what they do. I mean, uh, look at those cans, quite colorful, and you can recognize them in the shelves, especially of supermarkets and liquor stores. And they call their product snackable light beer because it's just 4.1 percent alcohol it's 102 calories there's no fat of course and there's just five grams of carbs and this is what you can use especially in the u.s for light beer for healthy drink marketing and this is where gallo chose to buy them just to give you some numbers over the last five years montaki has grown from 130,000 cases to over a million cases so this is an 8x over five years. And this is probably the reason why they caught the attention of Gallo. And then Gallo said, okay, why don't, don't we buy those guys and integrate it in our portfolio? What Gallo says is super interesting. They say it's an exciting new opportunity to reach consumers in different usage occasions. And we look forward to collaborating and growing Montaki across the beer distributor network. So for them, it's in addition to their existing portfolio, um, especially in this low ABV range, at different locations, maybe another probably younger peer group and to offer their existing peer group another alternative. I don't know if the people get it that this belongs to Gallo. Hmm. I don't know. It's an interesting move and totally understandable. 
Next big thing coming from Europe this time, Carlsberg and Erdinger. So the Danish company and the German company did a cooperation on Jurgen Klopp. If you guys are not familiar with football, with soccer, whatever, Jurgen Klopp is one of the most famous German soccer coaches. He has been the head coach of Liverpool for the last nine years, I guess. And he said, it was amazing for me to work with Liverpool. I did not only grow the brand, I also grew my love for the club and all this kind of stuff. And he's very, very closely related with the club. But in his last press conference, he said, I have to leave because I really struggle with my energy level and it's not good for me in the end. So I have to leave. Today, or when you're listening to that on, on Friday, was his last press conference he gave. And yeah, he, he you you were able to feel the emotion. And Erdinger and Kasberg decided to dedicate a special beer to Jurgen Klopp. It's um, a mixture between um, German and Danish brewing culture, I would say. And it's limited, what is it, 491, 700 50 milliliters beer bottles. Why 491? This is uh, one beer for every single game that he has been the coach of Liverpool. And there is, of course, some quite famous numbers. For example, the bottle 206 was the Champions League game, the Champions League match from Liverpool against Barcelona, where they beat Barcelona with 4-0, 4-0. Or another game, the 208 2-0 against Tottenham Hotspurs or 5-3 they won against Chelsea. Yeah, so this is a limited edition. 491 will be available. They will be auctioned on this specific platform and every single pound that is earned will be given to a good cause. So this is just good branding, good marketing and a good intent in so many ways. You use the strong power of big communities. You bring two very famous brands together. Of course, you have a huge community in soccer and in football. And there is a very strong, very close relation of beer and soccer. So this is just brilliant. Just brilliant. Let's put it like this. I don't know. Um, I mean, 750 milliliters beer bottle. I don't know why they did that. But maybe this is the attempt of fighting the pressure of the beer, uh, of the wine industry. I have no clue. But yeah, it, it looks like a Burgundian wine bottle. With the red label, of course, the colors of Liverpool, the face of Jürgen Klopp on it. And it's called Believer's Brew because in his first press, during his first press conference, he said, I'm here to make doubters to believers. What a freaking great story, isn't it? Wow. Goosebumps. I don't know if you have listened to the last episode of Pinon Pixel number 157 was the interview with Guillaume Laguerre, the PV Pope of England. He is so deep into growing uh, fungal resistant grapes. He has this scientific background and he knows how to treat those plants and he will build up his whole portfolio in the future on PV, on fungal resistant grapes. And we also talked about Divico. And I have tasted, I would say, two or three Divicos in my life and I can't say anything about it, but the reputation of the grape is not the best. And there is some people who like it, Guillaume, for example, and there are some people who don't like it. Nevertheless, it could be an option for the future. There is 75 hectares in Switzerland. It's a Swiss grape variety. And we see more and more English wine growers that are looking forward to grow this grape and to make wines out of it, red wines, still red wines out of it. Why is that? It's a grape that tends to ripen earlier and that also tends to, of course, being fungal resistant, but developing fuller body reds. And this is still a thing that, of course, England struggles with. I mean, there is Cabernets, of course, there is some great Pinots, but this is more like the cool climate, more fruity, elegant kind of red wine. And if you're looking for like, you know, the powerful wines, I mean, if you're a Ramaroni lover, you shouldn't buy English reds, at least at the moment. But maybe Divico can change that in the future. We will see. I'm pretty sure that we will hear more about this grape in the future, especially due to the climate change and to the wet conditions you usually have in some specific regions, especially in England, that it might be a good idea to 
work with fungal resistant grape varieties, not only in England, but especially there. And we will see some good wines from that. Guillaume said to me in the during the interview, I will give you a good Divico when we meet each other for the next time. So it's the latest in November. Looking forward to yet to that, Guillaume. So let's see what will happen. And I'm pretty curious what we will see of Divico going on in England for the next, uh, I, would, I would say, years. Last news, also from England. I found a book. I stumbled over during my research for London Wine Fair that is happening next week. And it's called Local Legends, The Hidden Pubs of London. And it's a book made by... Uh, a British writer, uh, he's called John Warland, and a German photographer, Horst A. Friedrichs. And what they did is they did two years of research and, of course, also testing and taking photos of 38 different pubs in England, in London. But not the touristic ones, not the big ones, not the known ones, but more this hidden gems. And super, what, what I mean, the result is uh, a super interesting book. I haven't read it, but I just read some articles about it, some um, samples. I saw some pictures, and the story is just beautiful. I mean, it's the idea is to provide a book that gives you kind of a guided tour through the drinking culture, the history, especially of London, the pop history, beer, and it's less about very blinky places. It's more about the, what was the, um, it's not for the gram was the the, uh, the title of a section in an article on the drinks business. Um, so it's more about finding, I mean, <laughs> the, the German photographer of course said we're trying, to, we were trying to select the pubs which photograph beautifully, but on the other hand, of course, they wanted to tell a story and they want to talk about um, pubs that are not on everyone's map. So talking about wine right now, the personal pick of the week. Thank you, Lucas, again for this absolutely amazing idea. My pick of the week is a Chateau Roland de Bie. Chateau Roland de Bie is a Cru Bourgeois, a red wine from the Medoc area in Bordeaux. And I have a quite interesting history with this, not only with this specific bottle over here, it's a 2010, but with the winery itself. Uh, my first contact with Roland de Bie was during a testing of René Gabriel and it was the 2006. And the 2006 was the table wine, so basically served during every meal on a tasting with, I guess it was five flights. And I was so surprised by the development of this wine, of this bottle. And regarding the price, this is one of the better price values you can get in Bordeaux. It's usually between 15 and 20 euro. I guess currently the subscription is around 18 euro. So it's a great price value. And it's not super powerful. It's a quite accessible red from Bordeaux. Um, it's from the Medoc area, so the whole Medoc. And um, regarding the price and the aging potential of, I would say, 10 to 15 years, it's, it's super nice. The interesting thing is that in some specific vintages, especially in this one, 2010, it was 70% Merlot. So there's a higher percentage of Merlot, which gives him a bit more fuller, rounder body, a bit more charming red from the from the left bank. So this is why I like this wine and I can totally recommend it. You can get it in, in many, many places. And the, I guess the oldest one I have is from 2006, 2010, 12, and then I started with the vintage 2014 in a subscription. So there's quite a few available. And I would say probably in five to 10 years, I will offer a vertical tasting with this kind of wine because it's so cool to see that, especially a wine at this, I would say low price point, especially compared with other very fine wines with high quality wines, with expensive wines, um, has this aging potential. And I said this, I would say, I think a million times that there is, I would even say there is no other region in the world where you get a programmed aging potential of at least 10 years with every bottle from 15 to 20 euros on and higher. This is Bordeaux. And this is why I love Bordeaux. And I mean, of course, there is always, you can read it on the, on the cap. The name of the podcast is Pinot. There is no Pinot in Bordeaux. Nevertheless, Great aging potential, great wines, great stories. The history of Bordeaux is so freaking crazy. And 
I can also always recommend to dive deeper in this specific topic. And this is why I love um, drinking Bordeaux. And this is why I love collecting Bordeaux and drinking it with people like you that love wine and that are interested in sharing a good bottle of wine. If you're interested in Roland de Bide, hit me up and maybe I have a bottle left in my cellar. And if not, I tell you where to get it at a very affordable price level. Have a great weekend. Have an amazing week. We see each other next week on Wednesday with the interview with Mary Bridges from Gisborne Winery, uh, the wine that brought me to English wine, actually, the 2012 Blanc de Blanc. Would have been a great wine as a personal pick for this episode. No. It was Roland de Bee because it was just randomly picking a bottle as Lucas suggested. Lucas, thank you so much for this idea. And right now, see you on Wednesday. Ciao, ciao.